welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. My name is Glenn Taransky, and I'm a member of the advisory board here at uh, One Business World. Leading Entrepreneurs of the World features entrepreneurs, founders, and business leaders presenting on cutting edge topics and the latest in industry developments. Our goal is to provide the global business and entrepreneurial communities with a window into the minds of those who are shaping the future of the world. Today, we're very pleased to welcome recognized corporate executive, leading entrepreneur and investor, Jason Klein. Jason is an experienced media CEO, successful business builder, and turnaround leader. He is currently founder and CEO of On Grid Ventures, LLC, an investment advisory firm for high growth ventures in media, marketing, commerce, and information, with a focus on early stage ventures with leading edge location technologies. On Grid Ventures portfolio includes over 20 companies. Very impressive. Jason is chairman of the Harvard Business School Alumni Angels of Greater New York. Under his leadership, the HBS Angels of New York organization has grown threefold to be the largest angel investing network in the Northeast with over 350 members investing two to $3 million per year. Jason's also president of the Harvard Business School Angels Alumni Association with 14 chapters across four continents and over $60 million invested. Jason, it's great to have you here today. We look forward to your uh, your presentation here for best practices and welcome. Let me hand it off to you and uh, we will follow along and I'll be back with you as uh, as we uh, as we wrap up, okay? Great. Uh, thank thank you. you very much for that uh, terrific uh, introduction, uh, Glenn. And it's really a terrific uh, to be here with you uh, today and share some of the perspective that I have uh, gleaned and a lot of my fellow angels uh, have gleaned uh, making a number of angel investments, uh, mostly in the New York area, but also around the US and uh, and around the world. Uh, just give me a minute here and let me start my screen share. So the topic today is is really just thought my thoughts on kind of raising raising capital. Uh, it's not meant to give you specific uh, investment uh, advice. It's more general uh, information. Every situation is going to be a very, uh, very specific. Uh, you know, hence this legal disclaimer, which of course we're required to uh, to do. But let me just go ahead and and launch uh, and launch into it. Um, so where do we start? If you're if you're an entrepreneur and you have um, you know you're looking at uh, start a company, raise capital. Where's the first place that you ought to go for uh, uh, investment capital? Well, the first place should be yourself and your own uh, your own pocketbook um, self-funding is the path that most entrepreneurs have done if you look at mike bloomberg he took his severance check and plowed it right into starting uh his uh, his company um and also my own perspective which i'll give you some tidbits on throughout is very much based on the fact that earlier in my career as a corporate executive i made a lot of acquisitions of publishing and digital uh, businesses. Most of these were less than $100 million uh, acquisitions. And I will tell you, in the majority of the cases, you had entrepreneurs that self-funded these companies, built them up, ran it themselves, ran it well, um, were accountable to no one but themselves, and then ran it all the way through to exit. It may take a little bit longer than raising outside capital, but it is a very legitimate route uh, to, uh, to pursue. And um, I really encourage you to think about starting with your own capital and just maybe stopping right there. Um, it could be a lot easier uh, on yourself if you don't have outside investors, uh, no one telling you when to sell and, uh, and so forth. So not typical investment advice. Uh, and I think there'll be a few things hopefully you'll hear today that are, con are somewhat the contrary to what you'll hear from others. Well, second step is usually friends and family. Um, these are not really angels per se. I mean, I've made friends and family investments. The reality was um, I didn't look, didn't even look at the documents. In fact, I have an exit I'm trying to sort through right now. And I realized I don't even have a copy of the original uh, documents, which shows you the kind of due diligence that I did as a making a friend and family type investment. And most people do. That's not really angel investment uh, per se, but that's where you go usually when you exhaust uh, friends and family, and then you wind up in kind of this, what's become this hybrid world of angels and VCs. And let me talk about each of those uh, in, uh, in turn. 
first of all, there are a lot of angels in the United States. Um, the biggest numbers I've seen is from the Center for Venture Research. They show about 300,000 angel investors. It's coast to coast. They invest about $25 billion per year and an enormous engine of growth uh, in the U.S. Uh, economy. But they're not always that well uh, organized. They can, be, uh, they can be pretty hard to find. And also it's important, all angels are not really alike. Uh, they come in a number of different categories. Uh, you've got your individual angels. Um, you've got what we sort of like to call as professional angels, which is once you get a little bit of rigor at what you're doing and you learn some of the ropes from others. And then you have the formal angel networks of which I'm a member of, of several uh, of them. Um, both Harvard Business School Angels, I'm also active in New York Angels here in New York. Uh, let me talk about each of these uh, in turn. Um, individual angels um, typically have only occasional deal flow. Um, they really are often not that sophisticated about valuation and deal terms because uh, they don't do that many deals. Um, they typically don't do that much diligence and they can be hard to find. They kind of you know, lie under rocks in different places. You've got a network. Uh, you know, to find them. Um, as people step up their involvement, they'll sort of graduate to kind of a little bit more serious uh, angels. And these are distinguished by the fact they just have larger deal flow. They're more consistently looking at, uh, at deals. Uh, there's much, much greater sensitivity to valuation and terms, as we'll discuss. Um, they do real uh, diligence. Um, they typically are working to try to build a portfolio in, in, a, in a serious fashion. And when you actually run some of the numbers on, uh, on, on uh, Monte Carlo simulations and so forth, you need a portfolio of at least 10 investments to have an expected positive value. And in some cases, depending on how you invest, that number goes up to 20. And so professional angels are, are looking specifically to build a portfolio. They realize it's a bit of a numbers game um, and scale is important. Um, and so um, they're not just writing occasional checks, they're doing it in a bit more of a concerted fashion over time to try to build a portfolio. Um, in the United States, I'd say $25,000 has become the typical currency for an angel check. And the reason is it's a balancing act between two different forces. Lots of entrepreneurs don't want a lot of small investors on the cap table. And so even though some angels may want to invest five or 10,000 um, at a shot, um, that's really not in the entrepreneur's interest to have too many $5,000 investors on your cap table. Um, and if you're looking to build a portfolio of 10 investments, you got to take that check number and multiply it by 10 and maybe more if you're going to do follow-ons. And so the amount of capital that is kind of recommended you need to have to be an angel, it, kind of, it goes up. And so the notion to try to keep your, uh, your per check, uh, your per deal check down to something that's more manageable to enable a portfolio building is what gets us to the $25,000 kind of angel currency check. Important to, to remember as you, as you think about this. Um, if you have a higher minimum, you may rule out a lot of uh, investors and a lower minimum may come back and, and haunt you. Um, you can find professional angels in crunch base on angel list. I mean, they try, actually try to be found. Many have got uh, websites. And also what distinguishes them is they usually really do want to help. In fact, the data shows that the ones that try to help do much better than the ones that don't. The ones that get active tend to do better than the ones that don't. Um, and, and that's a key distinguishing factor of professional angels, this desire to really help entrepreneurs. Then you get to angel networks. And so that is, is you almost always networks of professional angels. Uh, this is like the groups I'm involved with. Um, we tend to have extensive deal flow. Uh, we've got uh, monthly or more pitch events. Um, applications are taken through an online system. So it's pretty self-directed. Um, angel networks are going to be very sensitive to deal flow and terms because of their uh, experience. Um, and, and, and know how they will do real diligence. In fact, the data shows that 20 hours of diligence is the mean that's required to kind of have a, a good batting average as an angel investor. Um, and that's why angels tend to band together in groups because it makes it a little bit easier to get the equivalent of that, of that 20 hours if you do it as part of a group. 
Um, and angel networks will often have angels that want to lead rounds, which is really critical. I'll come back to that uh, in just uh, a moment. Um, as I said, the check size still says it's 25,000, although you certainly have others, members that will write much bigger checks uh, than that. And if you go to an angel group, you can typically count on getting, you know, maybe 150,000, six checks of 25, or maybe a lot, uh, a lot more. New York Angels, um, Harvard Business School Angels in New York has funded a million dollars into, uh, into investment rounds, and New York Angels has done $2 million or more alone just from members of the group. So large Andrew groups can be pretty significant uh, contributors and often uh, more than, than, uh, than many VCs. Let me, I said I come back to leading a funding round. This is um, one of the topics that I include because in my experience, many, many entrepreneurs underestimate the importance of this. And so I do want to emphasize this. You really do, in the vast majority of cases, you really want to find a lead investor for your uh, investment round. A lead investor is going to negotiate the terms for all the investors in the round. They will do diligence. They will probably hire a lawyer, which you'll probably pay for out of the proceeds uh, of the round. Um, and they'll typically going to fund a portion, a decent portion of the round, 25% or more uh, of the round. And, you know, to be a leader, you have to have followers. And so what really defines the leader of a round is someone who can attract followers to those deal terms and help you complete your investment round. Um, you need to get a lead investor in the vast majority of cases as early as you can in your funding process. It should be the first thing you start uh, looking for. Uh, many sophisticated angels will not write a check into a round without there being an effective lead uh, in the round. Um, and, and so uh, it's important. And that's why professional angels and lead investors uh, and, and networks can be particularly important because that's where you're gonna find a lead investor or maybe a seed VC as we'll talk about uh, in a moment. But um, if you're dealing with just individual angels or friends and family, a lot of companies will waste a lot of time uh, rounding up individual, individual checks before they have a credible lead investor to consist with the rest of the funding. So what is a VC? Let me just start with some basics here. The distinguishing factor of a VC is that they're really investing other people's money. Um, you've got limited partners, quote unquote partners, because they're legally limited partners that are putting money into the fund, um, but they're gonna be fairly uh, inactive. Um, and the general partner is typically gonna get some kind of carry and management fee, typically 2%, maybe 2.5% for seed funds. That means 2% of the amount raised is coming off the top of the amount raised, and then a carry, which may be typically 20% of profits after some, after the LPs get their first tranche of, uh, of money back. Uh, those terms will certainly vary, but the key difference here is angels are investing their own money. They're not getting any fees. They avoid fees. They avoid having intermediaries. With VCs, you're looking at kind of a different uh, animal that is, is investing in, you, in your group. And there's certainly pros, you know, there's certainly pros and cons. These days, we work together. And so you look at the data uh, that the pitch book uh, collects, they're all wrapped up together about 6% uh, about, uh, of 166 million in venture was angel and seed stage. That's about 11, excuse me, excuse me, $11 billion a year into this combined group. And as I said, most of these rounds are gonna be syndicated. So 60% of rounds will have both angels and VCs uh, as part of the round. And so uh, only well under a third has got only one uh, or, the, uh, or the other. And so it is, very, it is often not an either or situation. You're typically gonna have both angels and maybe some small CBCs in your round. Um, now, this is something that many entrepreneurs don't fully uh, appreciate, which is that not all VCs are alike. Um, they vary very much based on the stage where they invest most of their capital. That's how I really like to define it. Um, uh, VCs that are primarily angel and seed stage, most of their capital is going into this round. The round that you're approaching them right now 
is the round where they're investing the majority of their capital into this angel and seed stage. They're taking a lot of risk in doing that um, because they really are the first significant outside uh, investor. As opposed to other VCs, which would be more like series A or series B or later VCs, they may invest in an angel or seed round, but it's typically just a placeholder. They're gonna be putting most of their capital into subsequent rounds and investing a check in this round just gives them access and a relationship with you, the entrepreneur, but it's not really the way they're typically investing the bulk of their money. That's really going uh, in later rounds. So the question is, should you pursue seed VCs or later? Well, uh, if you can answer that uh, yourself, uh, you know, some of the trade-offs are seed VCs will typically give you larger checks um, you may see a $2 million check, a $1 million check. They're typically putting significant money into this round because that's where they're investing their fund into this round. Um, if they're putting this much money in the round, you can expect a lot of help from them in terms of building your company and the decisions that you make uh, uh, around, around that. And you're also gonna get help from them um, in finding other investors to fill out the round. Now, later VCs are gonna write smaller checks into this round. As I said, they're just placeholder checks. Um, you may get better bragging rights. You may look at a big brand like an Andreessen Horowitz or a Graycroft uh, or a SoftBank. Those are great names to be associated with. And it may help you get funding in a later round. It, it may not, because if they're putting money into your seed round, there is no guarantee they're gonna put money into later rounds. and so you there's some potential negative signaling if they decide not to go forward uh, in a later round. You will get a very quick decision from them for these placeholder checks, but it's typically, in it varies of course, but in many cases, partners don't need approval from other partners to make these placeholder checks. So it's a very fast decision and there's very little uh, diligence uh, associated with it. Um, your expectations though need to be altered when you deal with a later stage VC. Um, they won't want a board seat. Um, they won't lead. They're not gonna put a lot of time uh, into the company. They're not gonna look to help you all that much because of their time uh, limitations. And as I mentioned, the signaling value with more sophisticated investors will not be that great because they realize you've got, you've got some name partner putting money into the company, but you're not seeing any real commitment about the VC to really put some serious capital uh, into it. And so again, I mention this because not all VCs on the cap table in the seed round uh, are gonna be the same and sophisticated investors will look at the difference and look at who is investing and how much they are putting into the round. Um, <clears throat> um, so how do investors, how do angels, uh, how to make money? It's as important because it's very much in line with how you as the entrepreneur uh, make money. To make money, you need exits and um, the first thing to realize is it's really okay to talk about your exit plan, exit plan. A lot of real entrepreneurs, you know, that's like, you know, it's like a prenup, <laughs> which is often advised in many cases, but it's a little, can be a little awkward. It's the same thing here. Um, but it, when you're dealing with outside investors, these companies are typically not going to dividend, pay dividends. The, the investor wants to know what is your plan for exit? What are, your, what are your targets? How long will it take? And you really need to put some thought into that and, and talk about it with the uh, investors. The reality is most exits, exits are by acquisition. Um, typically 80 plus uh, percent are by acquisition uh, or, or some kind of buy IPOs and now even SPACs are still a very small portion of the exit uh, percentages. So that then gets you to the question of who can buy your company and when. Um, how long does it take? Well, this is a bit of a complicated chart, but uh, this is a courtesy of the Angel Capital Association, Texas Coast Angels, um, a big group that we collaborate with a fair amount of time, um, had put together this data, which sort of shows uh, for their portfolio how the exits are dispersed. Um, is you can see most of the exits, uh, most of the shutdowns are in the first five years. That's the red parts of the bar. Um, they certainly happen throughout the period of time, but you tend to have negative exits, uh, if you will, 
uh, in the beginning, but the, and the real exits tend to have, are, are very much interspersed. You have a burst of things that happen quickly, and then some can take longer, um, and many will take, uh, you know, seven years uh, or more. So there's a really widespread in terms of years to outcome. So the question you need to ask yourself is who will buy your company? Um, and so to think about that, you need to think about kind of a rough time frame in a number of years when you have a certain amount of revenue, you know, either you're making money or not, not making money, you raise a certain amount of capital. I think the best way to think about this is, is pick a point in time, call it five years out, you have these kinds of metrics, and then who would be interested in buying your company? for those metrics, what strategic buyers would want the company. And as I mentioned, I came from the publishing industry um, and particularly in areas like professional publishing and medical publishing, legal publishing, college textbook publishing, scientific publishing, you're dealing with areas that are niche and there are tons of startups and the big publishers will sp spend years watching startups and then buy them when they're ready. A lot of industries are like this, Software and SaaS software has gotten like this. You've got a lot of things being created by entrepreneurs. You've got big companies that want to grow by picking up products. And so they're very much in the market for this. You need to figure out who all those buyers might be and get some sense as to which of them will be your priority buyers. One thing I do want to say is that you can't just say this is going to be perfect for Google or Facebook because you know that's a bit of a red flag. Yes, they can be big acquirers. But, you know, there's far more entrepreneurs that think their company's perk for them than they really, Google or Facebook, really have, you know, an appetite for. So you've got to think a lot more deeply about who's going to buy your company than just some of the big tech uh, giants. You know, next we get into this question of valuation uh, and, uh, and terms and, uh, and making a deal. And once again, I hope I say a few things that may be seen by a few of you as is a little surprising here uh, at this point. So here's more data. Um, this is again from the ACA. Um, you look at their member investments, 52% of their member investments were preferred equity. 37% uh, is convertible debt um, with the rest being other formats. Uh, safes, which we'll talk about um, was only 3% uh, of, the, uh, of the total. You may hear a lot about safes and other equivalents from other groups. But again, the data shows there are a fairly small percentage of the total dollars invested by angels. Let me talk about each of these uh, types. And purposely, I'm gonna give you a little bit more of the investor perspective here because um, I don't think you'll really hear it uh, from, uh, from others. So preferred equity is really what's preferred by most uh, angel uh, investors, it gives them the most the most kinds of protections. Um, there's guaranteed follow-on rights, which is important to an angel investor because um, they want the guaranteed right to invest in later rounds. Um, often that right is taken away if it's not guaranteed by later VCs. And so, um, and, and the data is very clear on this. If you're gonna get competitive returns as an angel, you need to invest in follow-on rounds. It's a clear best practice in angel investing is you write the first check and you at least write the second check and you maybe keep going because that's where you build your returns in successful companies. And that's why the guaranteed right to invest in later rounds, certainly the next round is important to sophisticated uh, investors. Similarly, angels like information rights, which you often get as part of an equity round. And it doesn't have to be that sophisticated. It's basically annual financials or quarterly financials, you know, maybe some kind of write-up. But uh, this is also in here for ex experience. A lot of VCs will deny this right to angels in later rounds, which is why it's typically guaranteed as part of a proper preferred equity round. Third is the a qualified small business uh, tax exemption. This is part of the federal tax code. Um, if you help, if you have, if you invest in a C, C corp, uh, if you're buying a regular, you know, corporate stock with a five-year hold period, if it meets, meets some other requirements, um, it will be exempt from capital gains tax after a five-year hold. It's the only advantage that angel investors get in this country. Many other countries have got lots of other tax advantages for angels. Um, this is a precious. 
uh, <clears throat> accommodation in the U.S. tax code that was made by the was made permanent by the Obama administration and is held uh, up till now. And uh, you know, it's it's important to be able to not pay taxes, to be able to get competitive returns uh, as an angel. And you can't get that by investing uh, directly in a note or safe. A few of the things I'll just skip off, but basically um, this is the preferred format for most angel investors. The second popular format is a note. Uh, I won't take too long to explain this, but a note converts into uh, the next funding round. Um, there'll be often as a cap, uh, which uh, is a cap on the evaluation. There's a discount to the next round and there's typically some kind of interest rate. 5 million cap, 20% discount, 5% interest rate. Those are sort of the most common terms that uh, we tend to see. Um, it's relatively inexpensive from a legal fee standpoint, um, but they do lack the protections of a properly negotiated equity round and, um, and they do put back the timetable um, to uh, convert into equity, which puts back, which resets the clock on the five-year capital gain. And also because you, if you have no control of the documents, a proper angel equity round, will, the documents will have a line that says, this is a qualified small business based on section 1202 of the tax code. And so you're giving investors something that their auditors will want, that their accountants will want to see uh, that, and it, that's not guaranteed in a note uh, conversion. So you're getting something that is much more likely to survive IRS scrutiny um, and legitimately be something that takes advantage of uh, section 1202. And then the final term, the final type you'll see often is the safe, simple agreement for future equity. Um, this is not uh, a favorite format for, uh, for angels. There's very few uh, protections that are afforded. Um, both of the angel groups that I'm involved with will not entertain presentations by companies that are dedicated to raising only through safe notes because uh, it's just not considered a, a valid type of investment for a sophisticated uh, investors. And so as you move down this range from safes to notes, the preferred stock, one of the good ways to think about it is that you are reaching more and more investors. When you switch your format, you're spending a little bit more in legal fees but hopefully you're getting it back in terms of the quantity and the quality of investors that you are uh, reaching for. Next, we get to valuation. How do you value the company? A big question, lots of different views on this. I'll, I'll give you one uh, perspective, but let me just start with a notion about really who cares about this? Well, you care as an entrepreneur because it dictates how much money, uh, how much equity of the company you're holding back. Serious angels care because they're putting money into this round. This is where this is what they do. They invest in angel rounds. This is the bulk of their money that's going to get invested. And so the evaluation of this round is most important to them, as well as those serious CBCs who are also putting most of their money into this round. Who doesn't care? Well, as we said, friends and family, because you know they're backing you per se, and and not, not you know they're really doing it more in personality than anything else. Um, later stage VCs, because they're going to invest most of their money in later rounds, and so the terms of this round just don't matter to them very much because they'll drive the terms of the round that they put most of their capital. Um, incubators don't really care because they typically have got a fair amount of common, and their model is based on turns it back. They're trying to get as many companies funded as they can. And so the terms of this round are not important to them. Hence, the, 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 their creation of, of simple uh, formats like safes um, that, uh, that just help companies get, get funded. Uh, and finally, some angels don't really care. I, I would say West Coast angels that just swing for the fences. Um, they're less sensitive to valuation because they're hoping the company will be a billion dollar company or not and they don't really care much about in-between outcomes, they're not sophisticated angels which re who realize that most of the exits are gonna be at less than $100 million. And uh, all those terms make a, a count an enormous amount when you look at your returns. Um, and, and so there's an uneven universe about who really cares. And so I'm pausing on this point because for you as an entrepreneur, um, there's signaling value in some people in your round and there's not signaling value in others. 
And I've seen a lot of companies that fill their early roundup with people that don't care about valuation. And, and the company will, is, is coming out with terms that are not attractive enough to enable them to complete the round. And a lot of serious angels are passing. And really that's why you have to really ask who is really knows what they're doing that's putting money into this round that will help validate uh, the terms. So back of the envelope calculation, I love this, on, uh, on how to think about uh, evaluation. Um, this is the way angels look at it. The winners must carry the losers. Um, the winners are, you know, you have the typical angels will target a 10 times return, as will many early VCs, which says if you're going to invest at $5 million, you need a $50 million exit, or probably better with dilution, but let's just go with the 10x for simplicity. And so a $5 million valuation says you need to think about who will buy your, buy your company for $50 million in five years or so. And, and so you as an entrepreneur, that's the list that we're looking for you to put together. Um, if you have a three million valuation, who'd pay thirty million dollars for your company? Not who would play four or six. That really doesn't matter. It's who will pay ten times that. And if you're raising at a ten million dollar valuation, then you need to tell who would pay a hundred million dollars to buy your company. And, and so this is how we tend to look at valuation and why we tend to ask who will buy your company um, and what are the metrics that all align when you come to us with your initial ask for money. So the data on valuation is really pretty clear. Angel valuations have actually held at a $5 million medium, a median valuation uh, for some time uh, right now. That's the median. There's a, a, fair, a fair spread. Um, again, you may be talking to other people that may talk this up. There, there is a very big range, though. The chart's a little hard uh, to read. But the 25th pretend, the, the bottom quartile, does, gets about a $2.8 million valuation. The top quartile is getting a, a 10 and the median is a five. So there really is a wide uh, range. Um, and uh, on the other hand, there's a very wide range of traction of companies of other non dilutive capital they may have uh, put together. Um, In some cases we're talking, we're comparing, you know, mobile phone type app startups which can be done, you know, on a nickel with uh, companies that have got years of investment and intellectual property in it. And so hence, there's a pretty broad range of valuations, but 5 million is the median to keep in mind. So I'm going to give you some benchmarks here. They're just based on observation. <laughs> there's no uh, IRR calculations with any of these, but you might find it somewhat helpful. And it does give you a perspective how some angels will look at this. So if your company is at the concept stage with no business plan, excuse me, with no revenue, just a business plan, but nothing, no product, nothing really in market, I think for most angels in, in, in my peer group, we're looking at a valuation that's somewhere in the ballpark of $3 million. Um, you know, three, two to three, um, you know, not a lot of deals get done at that kind of stage, but if you're going to be really early, it doesn't matter whether it's a big market or a small market uh, in many ways. If your stage is going to be this early, um, we're going to look for get a valuation that compensates us for taking the kind of risk that um, you'll actually be able to get a workable product out. And that risk tends to require a valuation that is somewhere well under the $5 million benchmark. Um, if you've got an MVP, you've got a basic product uh, with some usability, then you're looking at maybe a $5 million uh, type valuation. Then you're looking at those typical terms and the median. You often may have a little bit of revenue at that point. Um, that only helps uh, support it. Um, if you've got some serious recurring revenue, then you can start, you justify it in many angels' minds, at clicking the valuation up to the $7 million. Uh, ballpark. Um, and um, if you've got real product market fit, I'll talk about that further, um, then you're looking at a $10 million valuation. You've got revenue, you've got clear product market fit, then you can start getting up there in terms of valuation. Um, look, you can get ahead of this. <laughs> and you may find some investors that will sign on, you know, that, 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 that may be fine. And if you can do it, you know, terrific, go for it. But um, in my experience, there are a lot more companies 
that are asking too much and entrepreneurs that are spending way too much time running around fundraising, whereas they really rather be spending time building their, their company. And if you set your valuation properly, um, you'll be able to get through this critical phase much more elegantly um, and move your company much uh, more quickly along to where you want to uh, build it. So how much to raise? Um, I'll get, again, I'm gonna give you a very different perspective on this. There are only two possible answers to this. Um, either one and done or enough to get you to the next round. One and done means you're gonna raise this round, you're gonna get to break even and cash flow, and you're not gonna raise money again. Angels love this kind of company. And uh, if you can raise enough money to get you there, that's terrific. Go ahead and do it. It will save you a lot of hassles down the road. Second is to get you to the next serious milestone, most likely those milestones for a series A. Um, and that typically means you need to have demonstrated product market fit, you need to have revenue, you need to have some level of repeat uh, customers. The important point I wanna make here, there is no third option. Um, raising money to get your MVP done is not a viable proposal to make to serious angels. Um, uh, you need to raise money to get you to the metrics for the next round. And um, part of the reason of this is the, is the it, it, this was true before COVID, but it's even more true since COVID. So many companies failed because fundraising dried up and angels had to write a lot of checks to help companies to get to the next uh, milestone. And if you're not raising enough money, it just means you're gonna get back to your angels with, with another request for funding. And that's not what angels are here to do. They're here to bridge you to the next round where you can get the next kind of external funding. So you really need to focus on getting to those real metrics. Um, I'll just spend a minute here and uh, product market fit. Um, if you consult Professor Jeff Buskang's uh, writings, he's got a very clear definition of this. Um, uh, if you've got an LTV over CAC of 3X, you're growing at 10% month over month. You've got less than 30% churn and you have a net promoter score of 20 or more. I don't have time to go into this, but in many cases, a lot of VCs uh, ascribe to this theory. They have very clear metrics on what they're looking for to fund a series A round and product market fit. So I would take a look uh, at this. It, so in many cases, it's gonna require more funding than you're probably thinking. So what to expect uh, when you pitch uh, an angel in any or an angel network, uh, it's gonna go quick. It's gonna be very time compressed. You may have 10, 10 minutes to pitch, a 10 minute uh, uh, Q&A and some member uh, discussion. You're not looking to get investment decisions. You're just looking to peak interest of enough people to, uh, to continue into the next round. So what do investors look for? Um, you know, it's gonna be up to individual investors. You know, some important considerations is gonna be your team and, um, and your abilities. Um, and also your ability to recruit uh, a management team. Um, and if you don't have a team and you're a first time entrepreneur, I think the important criteria here is are you humble enough to realize what you need um, and to put that into your plan um, and not think that you can just do this whole thing uh, entirely on your own. Um, second, they're really gonna look at your product and whether it's defensible or not. Um, being first to market is not enough to get an investor to move. Um, they'll look at your IP, they'll look at your insights, they'll really look at whether you have a defensible product. Um, they'll look at the funding risk, whether or not you're raising enough money to get you to the next round and is there a lead investor? And they'll look at exit uh, potential after considering uh, the risk. What to expect post-investment? Well, if you, if you keep in good touch with your angels, you should expect a lot of help, a lot of the help with value-added introductions, um, to other investors, a lot of help with uh, sales development tactics, um, and, and funding, both in good times and bad, you should expect follow-on uh, checks. Let me just wrap up with, a, with five tips uh, to, keep, uh, uh, to keep in mind. Um, first, be sure you know your audience before you make a pitch. Read the angel's website, ask questions before you take a meeting, respect the angel or any investor, VCs in particular, 
um, will have an investing zone. Don't waste your breath if you're outside of their zone. I don't invest in cryptocurrency. I won't entertain a pitch. So, you know, don't, don't give me anything in cryptocurrency. There are a lot of areas I won't invest in. You want to qualify your investors before you start spending time uh, and effort on them. Uh, second, um, you want to sell investors twice. And, and this is always going to be true. Uh, people have a left brain and they got a right brain. The left brain is, you know, kind of the quantitative type. You want to answer all the likely questions. You want to have, do all your homework. You want to anticipate questions. You want to be, really be buttoned up so that when you get questions from angels, you have really great answers. On the other hand, imagination and the right brain and creativity is really important. You want to make them want to crave your company. Um, you want to paint a vision that's exciting and you want your anger to jump on board with that. Um, you need to do both in a pitch. I really prefer pitches where they capture the imagination quickly in the first five minutes of the presentation. That time is precious. Get right to it, make them drool in the first five minutes, but then you want to cycle back and give them all the facts so that people can sort of justify, justify their gut uh, decision. It's important to do both. You're never going to get by if you can just do one or the other. Third, you want to have three pitches ready before you even start the funding process. You got to have your elevator pitch, that five, five minute version that makes people want to crave your product. You need to have a short deck available um, that gets the essentials across that you can present quickly and send to people. And then you should have the complete deck that's got your financials, your cap table, all the information that angels uh, and VCs will want and that you can just shoot to people right away when they ask for it. You really don't want to start until you have the full deck ready because you're just going to waste. You're going to get someone excited and then you're not going to be able to close. So my suggestion is get all three formats done and perfected before you begin your fund at the various two process. Fourth, you really should deal with your works. Um, any concealment of real negatives undermines trust. Um, you need to acknowledge them and explain them. Don't be silly and don't start with your awards. I mean, that's certainly bad, bad, uh, bad selling format, but you don't want to wait to be asked. If you got fired from your last job, just put that out on the table. If you had a failure, put that out there. If you're, if you're hiding something and it comes up in diligence, it can undermine the entire round because it's undermining your, your credibility. So figure out a way to put that, not necessarily in your first 10 minute presentation, but in your first serious discussion, be sure you're upfront with any issues and not conceal it. Uh, and then fifth and finally, be sure you attend to your angels after the round closes. Um, they can help you um, if, if you help, uh, help them. So thank you very much. And Glenn, let me just turn it back, uh, back to you. It's been a pleasure to be able to uh, run through this. With, uh, with everyone. What a great playbook, incredibly informative uh, throughout. So thank, thank you for sharing, thank you for sharing all of your, uh, all of, all of your insights. Uh, I remember the movie, Other People's Money. <laughs> I actually, I actually saw the play as well. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a really good analogy. You know, when I, when I worked at the New York Stock Exchange, uh, one of your earlier you know, you, where do you start point where you, that you, that you, that you uh, jumped off on? One of the things we used to always ask the companies right out of the gate when we met them, even though the name of the game was to, you know, get them to do the transaction, get them on the tape, right? We always used to ask them, you sure you want to do this? Are, are, you, are, you, are you prepared or ready for what's going to happen next? You know, people that don't know you coming and asking, asking you, uh, what's this number? Or why, why did you do that? Or questioning your strategy. So a lot, a lot can be said for that, and I, and I, I've worked with some, some entrepreneurs here over the last uh, last couple of years, and, and that's often that's often the case. It's like, do I really need an outside investor? So that that's a really a great first question to kind of ask. Uh, I got a kick out of what you said about uh, the family and friends and <laughs> not not being supportive, but then not not necessarily finding the uh, the paperwork when it, when the right time came. That's uh, I think that's human nature, and it shows that you're a good friend. Kind of, kind of, as you, as you, as you, as you, as you, as you got started there with, 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 with that round. Yeah, on the, on the five tips, any particular one? I mean, they're all important. Any particular one that you, that you really, really hone in on a lot? 
you know, the one I'll emphasize is is that is the left brain and right brain because I, I think a lot of people think it's it's um, you know that may they they'll do one or the other, and I think the best entrepreneurs will really do both. And the ones that I coach, uh, I'll certainly uh, um, and the ones I have successfully coached through, particularly to raising a, a Series A, I'll spend a lot of time trying to get all aspects of that uh, done just right where you've got the long version and all the real questions that have been answered. Plus, you're able to express a vision for uh, the business that is realistic, that get people to, uh, you know, really crave uh, investing in the business. And the thing about the vision, you know, it's got to be at the right level. It can't be, you know, I'm going to dominate the software business. We're going to be the next Microsoft of software because no one's going to believe you with that. Maybe you can do it, but you're not going to win people in a, in a $1 million round to think that you're going to create the next Microsoft. It's really got to be a vision to dominate something that's interesting and, and compelling and, uh, and valuable. And, uh, you know, so it's a combination of it's a problem that really needs to be solved that people can relate to and something that really says why you and your solution is really right for that problem. And you really want to boil it down so you can just do it, you know, really, you know, really quickly and simply and elegantly. Um, but then you've got to have the details to back it up. What, what I found particularly interesting, because I, I kind of value myself as a, as a relationship person, I, I, I like the fact that I mean, I mean, the world always needs check writers, right? You're always going to have to have that. But I, I really, I really uh, thought the mentions that you had about ongoing relationships, tending to them after the investment, keeping them informed, uh, keeping them also potentially involved down the line. I think that's great, especially for any anybody starting off, because you know, as you meet people, as as people take an interest in you, especially the ones that have done you know any, any sort of kind of due diligence on your company it's really an endorsement, right? It's kind of a belief in what you're doing. And, and okay, you need, as you said, you need, you know, at least, at least 10 investments and, and depending on the size and not everyone's going to be, be a home run, but, but the ones, the ones where you, where you spend the time, I, I think the ongoing, the ongoing connectivity is really important, uh, especially, especially as, as the, as the business kind of starts off and then begins to mature, right? Absolutely. Look, angels are doing this you're, you're, you're not putting the time in to build a portfolio of 10 or 20 investments because you just want a financial return. There's a lot of easier ways to invest your money that don't take as much time um, as angel investing. Um, you're doing it because you want a financial return on some prudent portion of your, uh, you know, your nest egg. Um, but you're doing it because you enjoy it. You enjoy dealing with the entrepreneurs. You enjoy helping companies be successful, you know, many angels um, are successful entrepreneurs themselves. They understand the startup process or have come to understand it uh, uh, pretty well. Um, and, you know, there's, a, there's some data from the Kaufman study, which looks at the, the qualities or characteristics historically of successful investors and uh, investing in areas that they know uh, is very important. I mean, people tend to do something like five times better if they invest in the areas that they know, and if they get involved in the company, they'll also tend to do orders of magnitude uh, better. And so they want to help. And it doesn't mean that every angel is going to help you, you know, all the time, but it does mean if you've got, you know, 10, 20 angels in your company, you have right to expect that, uh, you know, a handful of them will be good valuated uh, advisors, but also every so often, um, I think a really smart, entrepreneurs that I've invested in, they'll do a quarterly update. And the last line of every update is how you can help. And for many of us, we almost don't care about the rest. We just go right to that last paragraph and see, because if there's something that we can do to help, we'll of course try to help them. And it can be real specific. I need an introduction to Heinz to sell my product. It could be very specific like that, which some people you know, can help with or not, right. but we're always looking for ways to help. Uh, that's really important. I, I also really appreciated the fact that you said to be ready, you really need to have all three of your decks ready to go, right? You know, when people say, hey, can you give me information? It's like, oh, I'll, I'll be back to you because, you know, you wind up losing losing that type of momentum. But having it in stages like that kind of gets gets the that initial interest, builds further interest, and all of a sudden then they are 
then they are making the investment because they're seeing the, the, the deeper dive. Hey, in your experience with, with some of your own due diligence, any, any, interesting, any interesting surprises along the way? Anything that you, ever, that you came up with one and said, oh my God, look what I found. Um, we did have one company where it was a tech company um, and the founder uh, claimed to have an MD from a major institution. He was a research scientist and claimed to have graduated um, from uh, one of they have uh, this particular university. It's a major university, has a hybrid kind of MD PhD program. And uh, when he, he pitched us and a major uh, VC, um, those were his credentials that were uh, listed. Um, he got a major VC to lead the round. Um, Harvard Business School Angels was uh, participating in it. And, you know, for some reason, um, the, 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 the lead investor that I was leading it was someone else. And we just started to get very suspicious about this guy and his claims. He was making some vast technical claims, nothing to do with with medicine, but we started to wonder about his credibility. And so we started inquiring about whether he really had this uh, degree. And, you know, it's actually fairly hard to get a degree verified, particularly if someone claims to have had it awarded uh, in the past six to eight weeks. Uh, but we did uh, verify that this individual um, had attended one class to get his medical degree and audited a few other classes, but had been rejected as a candidate. He did get his PhD, but he had no MD. And uh, when we uh, mentioned that to him and we mentioned it to the lead VC, the round evaporated immediately and the company failed sure. uh, within two weeks of that. And so I don't know why this fellow lied about having an MD. It just made absolutely no sense. But uh, that little white lie you know, cost him and he had family members who were working with him in the startup. It cost him and his family members uh, their startup. Yeah. Now you you had you had a couple of couple of thoughts on trust, and certainly that that would echo that would echo that part as well. Right. Well, listen, Jason, it's been a delight. You've been incredibly informative today. Uh, thank you for spending time with with us and our audience, uh, and being part of leading entrepreneurs of the world. Uh, we wish you the best of luck in the future, uh, and hope to see you again soon. Okay. Great. Thank thank you very much. And if you're interested in applying for funding, just go to hbsangels.com or hbsangelsny.com. HBS Angels will give you all of our 16 chapters around the world. And if you want to apply to New York, you can just go to the hbsangelsny.com and all the information is right there. Thank you for that and, and sharing that. And I will, uh, I've, got, I've got the addresses written down and I, I've got a few folks that I, I have in mind. So thanks so much. Great, thank you. See you next time. Take care, Jason. Be Good well. luck. Thank you. Bye-bye.